Ready? Here we go. Hey, friends, welcome to another episode of Making Spaces. I'm one of your hosts, Sarah, and this is... The other host, Josie. And today we're really excited to have a friend of ours and a co-irreverent podcast media group. I said that wrong, but... Basically, we are so lucky to have Mason today. Uh, Mason has a fantastic podcast that everyone should immediately go subscribe to called Ah People's Theology, right? It is called that. Is it? I, I've never had the Ah pronounced that You have to do way. Ah because there's the People's Theology, which is totally right, there different. Is. It's a different, but, it, but I, I would say A People's Theology, but that's oh. because I'm probably Minnesotan. And no, I, it's definitely A People's Theology. I'm British. And Canadian. I don't know. At people's theology. That's great. I A people see I also say Amen differently than Americans do. I get told all the time. Amen. Mm -hmm. Whatever. So Mason, we're so glad to have you here. <laughs> what a now, bully. Now that we've picked apart Sarah, who has clearly doesn't know how to speak English. Um Mason, the question that we always ask everyone as they come on is where is one of your favorite spaces and then why? Oh. Oh, what is one of my favorite spaces? Um, I love my headspace. I'm a Enneagram four, and so I live in that space. Oh all my gosh. I'm in my, I'm in my mind all the time, imagining different things. Uh, and I'm not a good musician, but I like try to like make songs in my head all the time. I don't know, like I'm just always in that space. And so uh, I, I am an extrovert, but I do love like having some of that alone time to just imagine and uh, be creative in my mind. And so that's a space that I love being in. I like that. I like that idea. Also, I would pay money to be in your head <laughs> oh. just for like a couple hours. I'm, I'm trying to pay Some money wider. to get out of my head. So it'd be, well, maybe we can trade. Maybe it's a nice oh trade. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, wow. Mason, a lot of your work is helping people engage the space of theology in a way that is, um, I would say, making it more approachable for folks. Um, so when this podcast really is a podcast about making space literally and figuratively, um, and I've watched you uh, over the years make space for folks, um, especially like on Twitter, to sort of engage some of the tougher things with a theological framework. Um, you want to talk a little bit about how you got there because I just recently learned that you were a college football player. And by the way, I looked you up. You're pretty good. Um, so you want to up. <laughs> I did. I didn't know you could do that. Oh, honey. So much about sports that you don't know so much. I have an yeah, I have app. a sports injury. Okay. So leave me alone. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, you want to talk a little bit how you got into the space of making space for others on the theological framework? Yeah, I think what really ultimately inspired me to do that is because that's what was offered and invited me or I, I, that's what was offered to me when I was you know starting to explore my theology in ways that I was never able to before so people like Rachel Held Evans and Nadia Boltz Weber and Brian McLaren and Rob Bell and lots of others invited me into that space to explore theology in ways that I'd never been able to explore before. And so what I'm wanting to do is really kind of take what I learned from them and to be able to do that for lots of other people because of how meaningful it was for me. And so that's, I think, the motivation behind that and why I, I did that. Now, how I got into it, that's a different story. Um, I mean, I, I think initially it was around, like I really wanted to do that with youth. And so I wanted to create those sort of exploratory and creative theological spaces with youth. And so when I was in college, I was a youth ministry major. And after college, I didn't I know that work. was a thing until very recently, by the way. Yeah. Guys. Okay. In Christian like, colleges, youth, it is. Youth ministry majors or youth ministry was a thing. Oh, no, I was a youth pastor for six and a half years. Mason, we have oh. so much to talk about. Mason. I love youth ministry. So great. So wonderful. So yeah, I was a youth ministry major. And after I graduated college, I got to work at this really wonderful, artsy, hipstery, great church that allowed me to do this with a bunch of youth. And so I was hanging with middle schoolers and high schoolers being able to do this kind of work. And it was really, really fun. And yeah, I kind of got to a point in my life where I was like, I want to extend that to other people too. I want to invite other people into these kind of conversations and these different kinds of explorations. 
And so that's what I did. I started creating this podcast that allowed me to do that, where I was able to have these conversations with a variety of different kinds of people, some who were academics, some who were like pastors, some people who were authors, and every one in between. And I wanted to have conversations around theology and activism and lots of do- lots of those kinds of different conversations. But I wanted to have those conversations in a way that everybody can participate in. And that was really important to me. So, you know, eventually I, I changed the name to A People's Theology. And <laughs> A People, A, which one did I say wrong? What's the correct way? I would a, say a people's theology, a people's but theology. I guess you Canadians say it differently, but it might anyway, not be. It might be just a you thing. <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably the case too. I'm sure there's lots of words that I say too, that are like, I, you know, I would maybe say them differently and I would probably blame it on like a dialectical difference or whatever, but that's not the case. It's just me mispronouncing a word <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to extend that to other people and be able to make them make, make those kind of conversations accessible to lots of different kinds of people. Uh, hence, a people's theology. I wanted us to be able to explore theology in a way that really was by the people and for the people. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of how I got into that space of, of making a podcast and creating that space for people who uh, were in, interested in exploring theology in ways that they never thought of before. Because we're a podcast that talks to you, not just um, folks engaged in like the Christian world, but also folks who are designers, I'm going to explain that theology is simply just like Theo, the study of God, right? Ology, study of, Theo being the study of God. So it's just really like, it's a fancy word just to say the study of God. And I think sometimes we um, we we use big words to say uh to say things that could be simplified. And it sounds like that's kind of the work that you're enjoying doing is simplifying it a little bit, taking big, huge ideas. And and I think helping people too, like um, even if you've been in this space for a long time, there's a lot of, uh, Josie and I have noticed that a lot of people don't take the, the thing that they say and like play it out. So like, if I believe this about um, things like salvation or whatever it might be, like if you start taking that, that thought further and further and further, you realize like, wow, that that's a really interesting thought you're having about God. And so that's kind of the work of theology. And for those of us who love to live in our heads, it's a, it's a fun game. And then you hit youth ministry. I think it's great that you started in youth ministry because I remember coming out of grad school and being like, I've got so many great ideas about eschatology and all this stuff. And then you get to kids and they're like, my first class I taught, I was like, all right, guys, we're going to talk about why the word evangelism isn't a bad word. And I had a bunch of Cali skater kids and they put up their hands and they're like, uh, what does the word evangelism mean? I've never heard it. (laughs) And I was like, Methodist skater kids. Like they had no idea. They're like, I've never not liked that word because I don't know what that word means. So I think sometimes we take (laughs) for granted, right? When we're making spaces, we're like, wait a minute, this doesn't bother you because you've not even known it was a thing. Part of the reason why I loved yeah. also starting out in youth ministry is it it forced me to talk about these things in ways that made sense to a 13 year old who was going <laughs> through their first breakup or whatever. But also what I loved about it was I'm not that smart. And so it forced me to talk about things in ways that uh, in language that made sense to me. And so I was able to take a you know concept like eschatology, you know, this big multi syllabic word, whatever. That, again, I'm mispronouncing things. And anyway, so this big word like eschatology, and I would be able to talk about it in ways that actually made sense to me. So I was able to understand it more because I was talking about it in a way that would also maybe make sense to a 13 year old. And so it was sort of twofold for me. It not only really helped this 13 year old, but it also would help me kind of flesh out these ideas that I was having about these really big concepts. Yeah, I think anytime we can simplify something, I think language, um, before you got on the call, it was so fun. Josie was speaking to her mom in Spanish. And it's so funny (laughs) how when you have to explain something in a, a way that someone who's maybe not a native speaker or someone who you learn to take huge concepts and make them smaller. And I think that's so helpful, particularly for those of us who have engaged in the academic work. I'm going to say this, you are really, really smart, whether you well, like it or not. You. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Josie, again, with the petting your dog and looking like something from uh, Dr. Evil. She's a rescue. She needs attention. She was like, here like right here begging and I was like okay great fine you know (laughs) attachment therapy Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
Now, earlier you said something about the fact that you spent some time in what was known as the emergent church. And again, Josie went, what the hell is that? You want to talk a little bit about how that kind of helped you sort of get towards this idea also about the importance of space? Yeah. Yeah, I think about this a lot. So for those who don't know, the emergent church was this kind of movement within the kind of, I would say maybe like evangelical and Protestant worlds. So part of the the Christian world. And I would say, you know, like the first half of the, the 21st century. So, you know, around like 2000, mid 2000s, that kind of era. And a lot of the people in the emergent church world, what they really wanted to do was rethink not only about theology, but they also wanted to think, rethink, how do we even do church? What does church mm -hmm. look like? What sort of ways do we participate in a church? And what are ways that we can take what we have been given from the tradition for the last 2000 years from the church? What can we take from that and make it in a way that makes sense and works for people today? So one of those people that thought about that was a person named Doug Paget. And so when I talked about, I used to work at a church with youth, that the church that I was working with was pastored by a person named Doug Paget. And so what I loved about like some of the work that Doug did was he really took that idea about like, how can we reimagine church that actually works for people today? And he took that to the nth degree. He turned it to 11 for the kids that are listening. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and so some of the things that were sort of what I would argue were kind of like revolutionary that Doug did was, for example, we wrote all of our own music. You know, a lot of churches, they you know use maybe hymns that were written hundreds of years ago or, you know, more evangelical churches might use uh, worship songs that were written in the last, you know, 20 years or something. But these are songs that you would hear at a lot of different kinds of churches because they all kind of sing them. But at Solomon's Porch, because we were really committed to people being able to explore their own theology and their own spirituality through their own creativity, we really valued people creating their own kind of things. And we would participate in that as a community. So we would write our own music together. And so all the music that you would hear at Solomon's Porch, more than likely you probably have never heard it anywhere else because it was only played at Solomon's Porch. All of the artwork that you see, I mean, if you go to a lot of churches, you might see similar pieces of artwork, whether it's stained glass windows or other pictures of Jesus or whatever, but more or less they're like pieces of art that first off were not created by an artist from that community. And they're pieces of art that you would see in lots of other communities, church communities. But at Solomon's Porch, all of the artwork that you would see on a wall were created by whether it was a little child from our community or it was, we, I mean, we used to have professional artists, painters that used to be a part of Solomon's Porch who literally worked full time painting. And they would, you know, you'd see their paintings on the walls too. So everything was, all the artwork that you would see came from our community. Another really great example, and this is kind of you know, if anybody knows anything about the emergent church world, this is kind of one example that they would think of the most is that when it came to sermons, you know, usually if you go to a church and, you know, you hear a pastor give a sermon, it's, you know, just one person speaking about the Bible or something, but usually they're talking for, I don't know, 15 minutes or more. But at Solomon's Porch, what we were committed to was reading the Bible as a community together. So we would take, let's say the book of the gospel of John, for example, and we would go week by week, chapter by chapter. So I think there's like 21 chapters in the book of John. So we sure. would literally, I think there's 21. Uh, so we would literally take 21 weeks, chapter by chapter, go through the book of John. And so as we would read that, you know, someone like maybe Doug would facilitate a conversation. So we would read uh, this book and of the Bible together as a community. And then usually, you know, Doug or someone would have a little bit of commentary and then open it up for lots of other discussion. So it was kind of this like large group discussion, essentially. And that's how we did sermons. No one person's voice was heard the entire time in the sermon. Everybody's voice, for the most part, for those who wanted to speak up, were participating in the sermon. Um, what was the other? Oh, communion. When we did communion... You know, lots of churches, either you go up to a communion rail and it's usually kind of somber feeling or sometimes you like you get those little juice cups passed to you when you're in the aisle. One of the things that we were committed to was, first off, our bread came from a bakery just right next door. So we'd always get this day old bread. Pre-COVID, so guys, pre-COVID. Yeah, pre-COVID. Yeah, sorry. Disclaimer. Uh, and then we would 
just as a community, just sort of hang out for about five to 10 minutes and just kind of chit chat and break bread. So, you know, sometimes uh, you go to churches at communion and only the pastor or the priest is allowed to break the bread and serve you communion, or they're the only person that's allowed to introduce communion even. But at Solomon's Porch, everyone was allowed to introduce communion. Everybody was allowed to break bread and, and pour wine or juice for one another. So sometimes we had a, I remember one time there was a fifth grader that just got up and said, this is what we do at communion at uh, Solomon's Porch. Usually you would never see a child be able to introduce communion like that at, at a church. So that's, those are some of the things that I thought were really incredible about Solomon's Porch, because what we did was we created space for people to participate in whatever ways they were able to participate. They were allowed to be as creative as they were and, and allow that creativity to actually form and shape our community spiritually. The last thing I'll mention too, especially when it comes to creating like a physical space is one of the other noteworthy things about Solomon's Porch is that we took out all the pews in the building that we're in. So we're in an old Methodist church. And when we bought it, we took out all the pews and we brought in a bunch of couches and we sort of sat in a circular pattern. So we had all these old kind of like Brady Bunch couches all surrounded in a circular pattern. So that way, when you come in, first off, when you come into the space, what is supposed to be a worship space, a sort of sanctuary, if you will, when you come into that space, it's supposed to feel like home. It's supposed to feel like this is where I belong. The other thing is, is when you walk into a space that has a bunch of couches, what do you normally do when you're sitting on couches with friends? You want to have a conversation. You want to have a drink and you want to have a conversation about the things that matter to you. So that's exactly why we created our space to have a bunch of couches. The other thing too is those couches are all facing each other. So when you look at one another, you actually see each other's faces. You know, if you go to a church that either, whether it has chairs or pews, usually you're all looking in the same direction. It's more than likely you're seeing somebody's head and not their face or their back of their head. And that is so by the fact that we had it in a circular pattern where everybody can see each other's face, right? That also fostered a space where we can all see each other, have a conversation and meaningfully engage with one another. I love that. Actually, Josie made the face. Why'd you make the face, Josie? Because I instantly thought, because we at our church, we have pews that face each other because, you know, Sarah put little wheels on them so you can just like move them around however you I need bet them. casters on all of our pews. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder where Sarah got that idea from. Anyways, and Mason, as I was saying, <laughs> um, uh, I just immediately thought like, oh my God, I would fall asleep every Sunday on a couch. <laughs> what are you trying to say about my sermons kid no it's just Ooh. it's early in the morning you're already a little tired the coffee's barely kicking in and if you don't play it out right it's a, little, it's a, little a little nap time yeah that is a funny thing we always met in like the early evening so around like 5 p.m or something so we never really well there was one year where we met in the morning and i actually preferred it that way because I'm fine well, yeah. in the morning. I don't, I need, I won't fall asleep, but yeah, we did have a lot of people, you know, if they were, if it was in the morning, they were going to be falling asleep like you would. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. Cause I, um, I'm hearing a lot of like, um, one of my big time passions is, uh, restoration and, uh, reformation. So the use of old things in, in new ways. So for instance, uh, this idea of having a conversation. Well, that's what was known and is still done within uh, Jewish tradition known as midrashic reading. So you engage the text and you engage it together. One of my favorite visual images is whenever I go to Israel, I like to stand by the wailing wall and watch the rabbis. They'll come around a table and one person will open uh, the scripture and then they just all start arguing with each other with it. And it's like the best experience because to me, um, someone once said to me, I love it, the idea that like, you know, someone is done with a relationship when they no longer are curious about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I actually think it was from a Rob Bell book. I remember reading um, the story of Johnny Cash, who someone asked why their relationship works so well. And he said, because I can never figure June out. Like every day when I wake up, I'm like, who is this person? And I feel like <laughs> that's kind of the thing about scripture. And Rachel uh, Held Evans was really great at um, constantly being curious about it. And I love that idea of a community and culture coming together around this idea of what is happening here and creating their, in some ways, their own theology. And it's, it's interesting because I love that idea. And I love the, um, in culture, like the idea of it being like very contextual. And then I also wonder what would it look like for us to 
Like I don't, because American culture is so um, sort of independent, insular and our community, our thing, it makes it so hard for people who leave that area. And we live in a very transient, like America. Um, so what does it look like to have some things that harken back so that there is a connection to, so it's both contextualized and universal. It's just this mm-hmm. really neat. I knew a couple of people from Solomon's Porch. I thought it was, thought it was really cool. Is it even, yeah. is it still going? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Doug left a couple of years ago and now he's doing, you know, political organizing work with faith communities around the nation. But we did hire a new pastor just last year, uh, Reverend Nikki Front, and she's great. She's really, really awesome. So we're really excited to have her and she's doing really cool work. You, I love the point that you brought up around Midrash and you'd have all these rabbis circled around arguing with one another. And because of our sermons, the way the nature of the sermons being really discussion and conversation based, sometimes people would be like, well, what happens when people disagree with one another as if that was a concern? And I think when people disagreed with one another at Solomon's Porch during the sermon discussion, that's when things would get interesting. More so even, I think even better than that, that's where the transformation would happen. Yes. I think that's, don't you guys feel like culturally that's kind of where we're at? We don't know how to like disagree in helpful ways. And so we're Mm -hmm. all in little like bubbles and silos of just, okay, well, I'll just be around people who think like me. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like if we could help people and I think church communities have a unique opportunity to help educate and teach people around things. And I think one of the things is how do we, how do we disagree well? Like, how do I have coffee with you or take communion with you? I mean, you should really upset me or maybe suggested right. like whatever it might be. And I think instead of it being a, a relationship divider, a relationship connector, uh, Josie is an eight on the Enneagram. And so like fighting, not fighting, but disagreeing for you is relational making, right? Um, yes. For me, it's can be relational destroying. So how yeah. do we come together in a way that like, it, it kind of informs both of us and change. Like you said, it's the place of transformation. Sometimes disagreement is a place of transformation. And when we teach, we don't teach people that we make every relationship easily gotten rid of, right? Like, oh, that friend offended me so I can unfollow them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think the first step that I was never taught in church because I grew up in a Latin church that was very polarizing, even if it's congregation worshiped a little bit different than we did they were devil worshipers but anyways <laughs> their devil worship is very on the brain in latin churches it's pretty great but i think the first step would probably be to learn to be challenged a lot of times christians aren't very good at receiving a challenge they're all about apologetics right like they they want to learn how to argue their standpoint but god forbid somebody asked them the why question or the how or the who mm-hmm. or the whatever and that's probably as an Enneagram eight who has been highly <laughs> therapized. <laughs> I think that's the first step that we all should take maybe from that perspective is learning how to accept challenges and not as like, oh, they're trying to offend me or they're trying to demonize me or they're trying to call me a devil worshiper. Maybe they're just asking the question, even if they, if on their end, they're being a little bit chaotic and aggressive, we shouldn't, you know, then come off and further that situation. And what I think the great thing that you all are doing in this podcast is not only how do we create space in terms of like the sort of abstract space of how can we make those kind of conversations happen, but Mm -hmm. also what I love is how can we actually create physical spaces? Like what sort of physical spaces actually foster that kind of conversation and supplement that kind of conversation? And that's why I think the genius of someone like Doug really helped was, okay, we actually have to get rid of these pews because if we're going to have these kind of conversations, like if this matters to us, looking at each other's back of their everybody's heads and just you know when you look forward all you can see is another person's back of the head that's not going to foster that kind of conversation or uh you know when when you come into a worship building and you think that you know you're all facing in the same direction and you think that the only thing that's going on here is sort of like this kind of worship of god or the whoever's on the stage or whatever that's not going to foster that kind of conversation. So if our commitment is this kind of conversation, then we actually have to actually physically alter our space, which is why we got rid of the pews. And that's why we sat in couches in a circular pattern. 
I think there's also something important too about, and we've talked about it several times, not just as um, on this podcast, but the work that I really engage in is I think we have to recognize the death of the expert. So um, in, in that being like, we all used to face like college classes, everything face one person, they are the keeper of the knowledge. Um, but mm. what that does is dehumanizes my, like it, for me as a leader, it, it dehumanizes me, right? All of a sudden I'm on a literal pedestal, right? Which is sake, there's honor and sacredness. And we can talk about the importance of that as well. Like I've done the work, right? To be able to, I would say, I, I love this idea that Doug's uh, job was to facilitate like, yes. truthfully, that's it. But it became such a, that person is keeper of the knowledge instead of the person who is sparking the knowledge in others. And so even to help people think through, um, I love going into churches. I do a lot of consulting with church communities. I'll go in and be like, okay, so let's be, a, I want us to imagine we're a new person or I'll actually bring a secret shopper with me. And I'll say, what does it feel like when I walk into this space? What happens here? What happens? Mm. And if I'm new to a church community, if you were to walk into most churches where everyone is facing forward, what happens here is I'm downloading some sort of information from this person in the front. But here is like, we live in a time when anyone can hear a better sermon than mine. Let's be honest, like at any moment, just listen to a podcast. But so that can't be the transformational thing. It can't be the transformational right. space. Something has to be connecting with a community or whatever it might be. So I always like to... Um, just push people wherever, whatever their space is, what happens here? How, mm. how what is this thing informing us of? And that, and that was the beauty of, um, I will fight for ancient spaces because I, I think we've lost art in so many ways. And for me, art is such a passion. So like the fact that stained glass windows used to, um, used to made it at people's theology, a people's theology, whichever, um, because before people couldn't hear the story, they, they couldn't read the gospel, right? They couldn't read the story of yeah. a God. So having these images as problematic as super white Jesus is having these images at least, and those images looked like them. So maybe they're part of the story. Um, mm -hmm. and obviously that's problematic when it, they don't look like them, but I think there is this, um, need to ask why. Why did, and so when you look at like, I hate a box church. I just, I can't, I don't love when you go into like back in the day, like some of the churches, Josie and I have talked a lot about like this evangelical, like super like rock venue churches because it's Had still that chairs, right? It still has that same, like we're all facing one direction. I've come to consume totally. something on in my individualistic chair where I'm super comfortable in this chair. Um, there is a moment where I'm meant to like, say hi to people around me, but like not too much because like I came in in the dark and I'm going to leave in the dark <laughs> and I'm not going to be known. And for a while that felt really sexy and good. And like the super sexy worship leader at the front, it's all saying something. So what are we trying to say? And I think so often um, churches and people started going to conferences where, okay, they were packing the house for these concerts, i.e. church services. So clearly that's the right way to do it. So all these like Methodist churches or whatever um, right. denomination or whatever would go to these conferences and go, okay, we need to now buy a bunch of boxes when we already had the beautiful space in the inner city. It's like, we, we created this weird gentrification where we like sold all these like amazing buildings that were already community centers. And so, sorry, you got me on my passion thing. Like, I hate that. I hate that we lost the mm -hmm. ability to have local artisans, whatever it might be, where this is still the people's church. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm excited to see, I think a little bit about what COVID hopefully has done is made people realize the importance of gathering um, and the importance of like having spaces where actual gathering happens, mm -hmm. um, you know? I, I love that you bring up that kind of like community center piece because that's the one other piece that I've really loved that's been created at Solomon's Porch. And I think if you go to like, for on average, like any more white church, so like, you know, think of a lot of like even white evangelical churches or whatever. Here's what's interesting is they have these massive buildings, whether it's an old school church building or, you know, those kind of big mega church, uh, new kind of buildings, whatever kind of building it has. There's only one day a week where right. there's like 90% or more people in that building, only one day a week. So that means that the other six days of the week, 
it's almost empty other than maybe some of the staff people who work there or the occasional Bible study or whatever. It's almost mostly empty. So they have these big parking lots and these big buildings and they're mostly empty. But at Solomon's Porch, this is just a guesstimate. So I have no idea what the exact figure is. But my guesstimate is that 90% of the people who walk through Solomon's Porch actually don't ever and will never show up on a Sunday morning. I find that really interesting. And that's because we have rented out our space to lots of different kind of people. So we have a yoga studio that's actually a very successful yoga studio here in the cities. And we have um, an acupuncturist and a number of other um, health practitioners that do their work out of our building. So what used to be like an old Bible study room is now where an acupuncturist does his thing. And so most of the people who are actually coming to Solomon's Porch seven days a week are people who are actually using it as this kind of community center, not as exclusively this church that they go to on a Sunday. So that's what I really love is when a church is able to imagine their space as not just this space where people come to worship God, but it's actually this space that benefits the entire community, whether or not they actually come on a Sunday to worship God. I like that idea and I like your podcast for this reason. And it's, you kind of touched on this, Sarah. I love when the church gets rid of hierarchy in whatever way it can. I, as a person who doesn't do well with authority, don't like hierarchy. I don't (laughs) like people telling me what to do. But now that we have the internet, we all have this knowledge, right? And you, Mason, kind of break it down into this way that all people can understand, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. Unless, whatever. Um, Whereas before these churches operated under like a pastor who's like, I'm smarter than all of you. And then people then accepted that. And then that was, I'm speaking from experience here. And then that was always accepted, right? My parents go to churches and whatever the pastor says is whatever the Bible says. And then that's the end of the conversation. And then when you tell them, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. And my parents are actually very anti-theology, interestingly enough. Hmm. They think that theology is kind of devil worship. (laughs) I kind of get that too. I kind of grew up in a world where you're not really supposed to use your mind in that way. Right. Like what, you're just supposed to read the page and then that is what this the is thing why is. I tell my friend Trip that the quadrilateral is the sexiest theology of all time because you have mm-hmm. to use your mind. Mm-hmm. Keep going. <laughs> Amen. But yeah, I love the disappearing of hierarchy. And maybe churches will always need a leader, right? Maybe they'll always need the one person to be kind of wrangling everybody in and handling the situation in some way, but maybe in a way that's not. I'm the smartest person in the room and you have to listen to me and end all be all. And that's always been kind of the problem of the church in general, right? Is that these power structure and these power dynamics have always fueled colonialism, have fueled, you know, what's uh, the crusades, all these other Mm -hmm. things that are like, your pursuit of power is what brought this here. And if the church continues this pursuit of power, it's going to die as it is already dying. People are leaving. They're mad about it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But that's what I dig about your podcast, just so you know. What I loved about the work that Doug was doing when it came to like who can participate and what kind of participation happens in a space like worship, Doug literally took that idea that everybody can literally participate in whatever ways they, they want to participate. And he took that to really its logical conclusion. So while Doug might be the person in a worship space to facilitate what's happening, like all the different things that we'll be doing in a worship time. He often said, you know, if there was a baby that was crying, that's their way of participating in this space. And we need to honor that. Now, we might not think of it too much, but like that's really important to think that even a little infant who's crying, that's their way of participating in this Mm -hmm. space. And Doug really took that to sort of its logical conclusion. And that really mattered to me to know that whether it's a little infant crying and that's their participation or it's a fifth grader introducing communion or if it's Doug who is seeing this really great great brilliant commentary on the book of John all of those three different kinds of people are participating in the ways that they are able to participate and they're wanting to participate in the space mm-hmm. I think it's a I I feel this like rub inside of myself in that like this idea of like I am not a hierarchy person in that I don't necessarily want my leadership to be 
Um, I'm just not that person who needs to look. But at the same time, I've been in so many spaces where people who have not done the work are leading. And I think that, yes, it's important. It's a both and for me. Um, we make so many mistakes. Um, and by mistakes, I mean where we read um, scripture without thinking about context, where we, because someone hasn't had the privilege. I remember one of my professors um, said, you know, let's not lie about the fact that it's a privilege for you to sit here for three years and think through um, your faith, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it can feel like a, a burden. It can feel like all these things. And then, then to take it out, right? And to be able to share that. And I think when we have people who are only going to Bible colleges where all they learn is like the, their church's particular flair for things, the question, um, the question becomes, you know, how do we both make space for everyone to engage it and make space for there to have been some work around it so that we're not starting at ground zero or creating what can be, um, I think, a problematic lack of thinking or reading from all these different sources. Because for me, there is this beauty of um, the company of saints almost like all the people who have done the work before, you know, I, I often will. Um, and by often, I mean like once a month, go onto Twitter for a little while and I will like see and like all, all my tweets. I do. I'm like all at the same time. Sorry guys. I'm really bad at Twitter. I'm <laughs> learning. Mason and them are teaching me. I'm terrible. Justin is so encouraging. He's like, you can do it. Um, <laughs> I am learning are seeing people like have these thoughts that for them are so freeing and revolutionary. I'm like, oh, if only you had been able to engage that work before, what would that look like? But I also, so I have this, like, I hate anything pretentious, but I also hate anything that says that has a fear of, and I'm a little bit nervous that our community and culture has gotten to this place where we almost fear or distrust academia when mm -hmm. they could be both. And so I don't know. I just love your guys' thoughts on that as people who are like, no, I like, you know, both of you are, I know, because both of you are highly educated and continuing to be educated. And yet all of us want to have a little bit more of a leveling ground. So, yeah, I grew up in a faith tradition where you didn't necessarily have to go to seminary to be a pastor and saw the effects thereof, saw these men, because they were all men, saw these men who then took that power and were like, well, I, I know what I'm talking about because I've done this for so long. But then they never had the accountability of their peers, of peers. They never had accountability of people who were smarter than them. They were never around people who thought differently than them, which I think is academia, right? That's what you get. You get people who are smarter than you, who are dumber than you, and you have to engage with both. You get professors who you agree with or you disagree with, and you have to engage with both. Then you have to get a grade, and then you have to think about things from a different perspective, and then blah, 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 right? Like that's what seminary does. And if you're just learning off the internet, if you're just reading systematic theology or whatever you read. It's always you, systematic <laughs> theology. Like someone gets one of those books in a bookstore and then all of a sudden. That was what all the much. little bro Christian boys read at my Baptist church. And then they're like, oh, Josie, you don't even know what you're talking about because you don't want to read systematic theology. And I was like, no, I really don't. I'm also <laughs> smarter than you, but whatever. It's fine. But, and if you don't have that, you have no accountability to anything, right? You are only accountable to yourself and to your God. But then we've seen all these men who are super famous, who then have massage parlors on the side or whatever, right? Or are dating their pool. Yeah. Right? Can, yeah. That's mm -hmm. very true. Yeah. <laughs> They're drinking some black water. Um, <laughs> I think it comes down to this as an issue of power and not necessarily right. an issue of are there certain kind of structures that we have to have in place in order for people to be able to do certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I'm more worried about is like a misuse and abuse of power. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, now, for example, now, but that's not to say, you know, like, do, do I think a fifth grader should be leading Solomon's porch? No, <laughs> not because... <laughs> not because they are incapable of ever being able to do that, but it's because, you know, developmentally, they're not in a place where that would even be helpful or desirable for them. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's just a lot of reasons why we wouldn't do that. And why someone like Doug was a really great leader because he had done certain work 
to prepare himself and to really make him well qualified to be a good leader for Solomon's Porch. Um, but that's not necessarily because Doug got an A in all of his seminary classes, whatever. It was because he has shown and demonstrated that he was a, a, a good leader mm -hmm. who used the kind of you know things that he was able to do, whether it was seminary and his experience, he was able to use that in really good ways that um, I think greatly benefited Solomon's mm -hmm. Porch. Um, and so I think like that's something like we need to sort of think through that as we're, we're, but that's also not to say that like everything that we do within the church should have, you know, this strict, like you can mm -hmm. only do this certain thing because you've earned these sort of special privileges. I remember one time Doug was invited to go to this one, I don't know, it was like a Lutheran church or something. And, um, and there, I, I think like the head pastors, whatever of this church weren't going to be there. So that's why they invited him to like do their, their sermon or whatever. But because the pastors weren't going to be there that Sunday, there weren't going to be any ordained people at that church and they were supposed to do communion. And there was this big hullabaloo as they were planning with Doug about like what they were going to do. And, and Doug was like, well, why don't we have one of the kids do it or like have a group of kids do it? And they just were like, we can't do that. They're not ordained. Right. So we there's can't. things like that where I'm like, well, I, why, why is it that something like communion or the Eucharist is something that disqual like that, that, that is a certain thing that disqualifies certain people from doing it. Um, and so those are the things that I'm willing to question, but that doesn't mean that mm -hmm. a fifth grader should be able to lead Solomon's porch either. Right. So like, we kind of have to think through, you know, all the different elements that make up a church and start, you know, thinking through like, what is it that qualifies one to that, uh, to be able to do that certain element. Right. And this that. is the space making work that the church should always be engaging, right. Is asking, why do we do this? Can we change it? Should we change it? And always going through that and always asking the questions of like, why? Mm -hmm. my dad said yep. that was always really annoying as a kid because i'd be like mm, but why and i still kind of do that all that. the time <laughs> and why then that's not to say that a, a fifth grader at solomon's porch shouldn't have any say or any mm -hmm. sort of leadership at solomon's porch i think they right. should have actually a really important hand in mm -hmm. the leadership uh but also know that they probably shouldn't be heading up the entire leadership of it right um right. So I think their voice is really valuable. I think the third three-year-old's voice is really valuable as they speak up about their needs and what they want to see happen in their community because they are just as much a part of it as a six-year-old. But that doesn't mean that they're, you know, going to yeah. lead the entire, you know, operation. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think there's, um, it brings back to the idea of like, what is a church meant to be? And I think, um, particularly for me in the last five years working in a restart community where um, the church is super old, like the actual building. Um, we had to, we realized as I started leading the community that uh, we just had a lot of folks he either who were nuns or done. So never part of a church or like, we're like the worship leader and are done or like all the seminary professors that we have that go to our church. Like literally I'm terrible at pronouncing Greek or Hebrew. So I just say it really quickly because there's literally Greek professors sitting in our pews. They'll but let I, you know after. Oh, they do. They <laughs> laugh at me. Then we like Sarah. And I hate it because it's all recorded now. So I look like a real <laughs> dumbass. Um, but I think the the thing that has been so profound for me is to realize like, okay, like all these things that I just did thinking that people understood why they're important to, to us as a community. So why do we do prayers of the people? Why do we, why do we do, you know, and, and it's so easy to just run through it. Um, the example I always use is you guys are too young gish, but legally blonde was a big movie back in the day. And we know legally blonde, Sarah, you might, you might know it, but you might not actually have seen it, which I discovered yesterday with a 25 year old. Um, but there is this scene where she comes into the college classroom and I use this as an example all the time when I'm talking to people and everybody pulls out a computer and she pulls out a fuzzy pen, right? So there's this moment where she feels othered. And I think so often we want to invite people into spaces where they're going to feel like they're holding a fuzzy pen. If we don't assume that everybody in the room is at a different level of knowing what this is or the fact like, so I explain why we walk the light of the church, like why we light the candles and then why we turn around and take that light out. And, and I'll never forget this woman who was in her eighties went, Oh, 
<laughs> she had been going to the church since the 30s. She was like, I just never knew why. I just never thought about it. But it's, it's all cute. these, yeah, it was all these things that you forget. Um, you forget when you're you're so wrapped up in, oh, this is the way it has to be done. And so I love this idea of sometimes making space is really just about asking the why question. And that's like, you know, you do it so well on Twitter. I love it. Cause you ask people like, oh, you know, in a very sassy, like let's fight kind of way, but not really. Cause I think you engage people really well in that space. Um, and I wonder if it's cause you hung out with, how long were you uh, working in youth ministry stuff? Um, well, I mean, before I was at Solomon's Porch, I was doing uh, youth ministry for a couple of years while I was in college, but yeah, I was at Solomon's Porch for three years, I think, something like that. So I wasn't a youth pastor for very long. But it was very formative as, you know, I think about the other work that I'm doing now. Yeah. Yeah. You just... think about the kiddos who are, when I was a youth group leader, I had kids who had never gone to church. And if they had, they went mm -hmm. to a Catholic church on Easter. So, I mean, telling the story of Jonah to kids who have never heard the story of Jonah from infancy is like, well, how did he survive? What about the stomach acid or what? I was like, I don't know, dude. <laughs> don't I love me. those kids. They're like, th those are my like. Um, I was really lucky when I first started, uh, I was an intern before I came out here and then I was a youth and college pastor and I had, uh, three kids who were Asperger's in my youth group. Yes. <laughs> so there was no getting yes. away with just saying something. They'd be like, um, actually <laughs> that's not how whales work, Sarah. <laughs> I know. And I was like, well, back to the drawing board. <laughs> Mason, it has been so great. I would love to have you on again, obviously, but we always end this time together with the question. There's like one tangible way that people could, as you think about this idea of making space for theology and thinking, is there like one tangible way either for that or any way you want for people to make space for someone else or themselves? Mm, that's a really good question. I think one of the things that has really helped me as I've like explored what it's like to make space for lots of different kinds of people as they explore different kinds of theology is I first have to kind of go within myself. I have to go in my inner self and explore like what, what sort of space do I need for me to be able to do this? So I think for, you know, for people who are leaders or whatever you, it is that you might be doing and you're wanting to create space, whether it's in theology or whatever it might be, I think you really need to ask yourself first, what sort of space do I need for me to thrive? Mm. And then I think more than likely, that will be also the space that other people need for them to thrive. So yeah, when I do my theological work, again, it's because when, when I'm having these conversations, um, with people who are talking about theology, these big concepts, but in ways that really make sense, it's because I need that. And I've found that a lot of other people need that too, which is why I've wanted to create this space. So I think just examining first why you need that space and more than likely there might be other people who might need the space for similar reasons. Oh, mm -hmm. so great. Now, my next question for you is where can folks find you, Mason? Yeah, so I have a website, masonmeniga.com, all one word. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at masonmeniga, again, all one word. I also have a YouTube channel that uh, I haven't put a video out for a month now, but I'll be getting back to it here after my semester ends. And they're, you know, short five minute or so videos of me talking about theology. You know, I had a video last month about three reasons why you should deconstruct. I've had a video about why there isn't one true biblical Christianity. So lots of fun videos and I incorporate my humor and kind of my personality within it. And it's, I honestly think it's the best thing that I do out of my podcast and Twitter and all those sort of things. I think my YouTube videos are the best thing I do. So anyway, <laughs> check out that uh, and please like and subscribe and comment below. Ooh, all right. Josie, wow, where can folks yeah. find us? You can find us at makingspaces.com where you'll find literally everything. Or if you don't want to, you can go to Instagram and find us at Making Spaces Podcast. Uh, you can find individually us on everything. Sarah's at Rev Sarah Heath and I'm at Josie Takes the World. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. And thank you, Mason, for being here. And we'll see you next week where we will be saving a space for you. Bye. Bye.